Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that definitely hits close to home for me. It happened right where I live here in Arizona and it's always scary to think about the people that can be living close to you. But before we get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Harry's. I've been using Harry's for so long now. I love their razors and that's because they are the only razors that I can use for my very sensitive skin. Harry's high quality blades were manufactured in their own factory in Germany and are complete with a precision trimmer and a flex hinge to give you a close, comfortable, and smooth shave. Not only are their blades amazing, but they have a new two-tone design that have deeper grooves for improved grip, which makes shaving just that much easier. I have the chrome color and it looks just so nice and it's so easy to use. I also have Harry's Foaming Shave Gel, which is perfect for those of us with super sensitive skin like I do. Their Foaming Shave Gel is made with loving ingredients like aloe and hyaluronic acid. I swear by their razors and their Foaming Shave Gel, they are the only razors that I can use without ending up with some gnarly razor burn. Harry's is also super convenient. They deliver straight to your front door so you don't have to go to the store just to pick up your razors. Harry's starter kit gives you everything that you'll need for a close, comfortable shave. You'll get your five blade razor, your weighted handle, a blade cover, their foaming shave gel, and now you'll get one of their body washes just for you to try out. So the first 1,000 people that click the link down below and purchase your starter kit will get a free body wash. So that's harrys.com slash Rachel Shannon and the first 1,000 people to get your starter kit will get a free body wash. Thank you again so much to Harry's for sponsoring today's video and for your continued support of this channel. So with that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the devastating murder of Catherine Grosby. Catherine Grosby was only 44 years old when her life was brutally taken from her. Catherine grew up in California, but she attended college in Arizona, and she loved it here, so she decided to stay. From there, she worked as a kindergarten teacher at Arrowhead Elementary School at the Deer Valley School District in Glendale, Arizona. It looks like she had worked there for 20 years, and she was very well-loved by her students and everybody else who knew her. Friends said that Catherine was the type of person who would do anything for anyone. She would stop what she was doing just to make your day. She was fun-loving and someone that her friends could always count on. Her family wrote, quote, Catherine was a very special person that was loved by many. She touched many lives through her work as an educator, her love of animals, and her support of community members and those in need. Catherine always saw the best in everyone and was willing to help others. As an educator, she inspired, taught, and loved each child that walked through her door. Her former students are still a part of her life, which shows her dedication to them. Catherine loved running in different charity events, being in the outdoors, and spending time with her beloved dog, Sunshine. She was an avid reader who loved trips to Disneyland and the Grand Canyon. Catherine was a very energetic, bubbly, upbeat, funny, and overall charismatic person. She took every opportunity to meet new people, and she would love talking to them for hours. She loved to travel with the family to places like Australia, Alaska, river rafting, and hiking in the Grand Canyon and Mexico. She would often take trips to Loughlin and would often go on camping adventures with her friends. Catherine had an infectious smile that would make you smile with her. Her quick-witted humor was often beyond compare, and she would surprise you at any given moment. On her profile on the school's website, which has since been taken down, Catherine wrote, quote, Welcome to kindergarten Go Team Families. This is my 20th year of teaching. I'm looking forward to another year building the foundations of learning for the five and six-year-olds in my classroom. As your child's teacher, it is my goal to provide a safe, caring, and educational environment in which your child can grow and be an independent learner. I strive to create positive relationships with my students and their families that put the educational needs of children first. So it's clear that Catherine loved her job and she was dedicated to improving the lives of the little ones that she worked with. Now, during the summers, Catherine would often go to Williams, Arizona to work with the Grand Canyon Railway as a tour guide. Williams is a relatively small town of around 6,000 people, but it is a very popular tourist town. On one particular day, on July 10th, 2017, Catherine went to a local restaurant and tourist hub called the Wild West Junction for a meal. Here, she noticed that her waiter had actually injured his foot. 
That waiter ended up being 27-year-old Charlie Malzahn. The two chatted for a while, and she seemed to have a bit of a soft spot for him. So she finished her meal and left as normal. But the following day, she returned back to the restaurant looking for Charlie again. Initially, she went there with the thought that she was going to help Charlie with his broken foot. However, she was not working that day, so a coworker actually gave her the phone number of Charlie's sister, who ended up connecting the two of them. After this, the two continued to speak on a regular basis, and from there, their relationship blossomed. Now, let's get into a little bit more into who Charlie is. Charlie Malzahn was the stepson of Williams Police Chief Herman Nixon, but Herman would go on to say that the two hadn't had much contact for the previous 10 years. Charlie had attended Williams High School, but he did end up dropping out. Charlie also had a pretty extensive criminal record at the time. In 2008, he had been arrested and charged with theft. Then, in 2012, he had been arrested and charged with aggravated assault as well as resisting arrest. He served time in prison for these charges, and he was released from prison in November of 2016. He was also known to have struggles with substance use, specifically of meth and alcohol. He also seemed to have some mental health issues. By March of 2017, he was arrested and charged with extreme DUI, which means that he had a blood alcohol level of more than twice the legal limit when he was behind the wheel of a car. So overall, he seemed like he was somebody who was in need of a lot of help, and Catherine was the type of person who wanted to help fix others. She saw Charlie as somebody who needed help, and she saw herself as a force in Charlie's life that could help him overcome whatever it was he was going through. So, she helped him pay for his apartment, and they continued their relationship in the following months. However, by August of 2017, Charlie found himself in trouble with the law once again. On August 20th, he was riding in the passenger seat of his sister's minivan, with her driving with her two young children in the back seat as they drove on Interstate 10 in Tempe. As they were driving, it seemed that pretty much all of a sudden, out of completely nowhere, Charlie got very anxious and paranoid, and he started telling his sister that she was going to have him sniped by the car next to them. Then he climbed into the back seat and pulled out his 9mm Beretta handgun. Once he did this, his sister immediately stopped the van and she ran out of the van and took her children with her. After that, Charlie got into the driver's seat and drove away. She was stranded for a while after that and she had no idea where Charlie went and where he took her car. It wasn't until hours later that Charlie had called his sister and told her that he was in a bar in Williams with her car. So, of course, she immediately called the police who did locate him at the bar and found a handgun in his pocket. In the body cam footage, you can see an officer just walking up to Charlie and calling him by name because, again, he had a very lengthy criminal history, and he was known very well to police. The officers ordered him to put his hands on the wall, and he was arrested without any further incident, and he was booked into a jail in Flagstaff. As Charlie awaited his bail hearing in jail, him and Catherine had spoken on the phone several times. There were a total of 12 calls that were released, but unfortunately, I was not able to find the audio for all of them, but I did find it for some of them. Now, the initial phone calls started off as pretty normal. They started out just talking about how they were so excited to be talking to one another. They had small talk where Catherine would talk about her day in school and Charlie would talk about his day in jail. Then they started talking about their future plans. They talked about how once Charlie was out, he was going to move in with Catherine. There were several times throughout the phone calls where they said that they love each other, they miss each other, and they cannot wait to see each other. Charlie would often thank Catherine for her support, and he continuously said that all he needed in his life was a stable force to get his life back together. By mid-September, he started to ask Catherine for help in bailing him out. At first, he begged her to come get him. He said, please, I'll slick my hair back. I'll put deodorant on. She initially said that she doesn't have the money to bail him out of jail and there's no way that she could possibly get him out, but eventually she started to say that maybe she'll put up her house and or her car as collateral. This is a call from and paid for by 
Charlie Malvon, Copinino County Jail. Can you come get me? I hate Catherine, I'm si <laughs> Catherine, I'm sitting here waiting for you. Will you please come get me? I mean, I'm going to slick my hair back with some gel. I'm going to put deodorant on. Because if we do this, we're in this together. All right. For the long haul? Got it. For the long haul? Yes. Mm, I love you so much. <laughs> I love you, too. And we're going to let people think whatever they need to think. We don't care if they like you. You're just going to do your best. Everybody's going to like me because when I'm doing my best, I'm sorry everybody likes me. I have $2,000. Mm-hmm. But I don't have $20,000 collateral. What do you mean? I mean, my house doesn't have any equity in it, and my car is not worth 20000 20000 for this? Not even a deal? But I don't think you're that dangerous. Are you that dangerous? After this, they continued speaking on the phone for another few weeks, but it seemed that their conversations were starting to turn more dark. Now, while Charlie was saying some pretty disturbing things, which sort of shows his mental state at the time, Catherine was more or less just going along with it, and she seemed to think that it was more of like a dark humor situation and nothing serious. He would say things like he wanted to kill a dog. He said that he wanted to cut a baby and drink its blood. Then he said that he would decapitate anybody who was talking to his lady, referring to Catherine. He said that he also had a fantasy of staging a fake murder where he would cut Catherine up with razors and then use fake blood. However, in their last recorded jail phone call, Catherine was more convinced to find a way to bail him out. She said that she would figure out how she was going to do it. So, she ended up getting help from a bail bondsman and she told him that she was ready to come get him. During the call, she outlined all of the rules that he had to follow in order for him to be bailed out. He had to check in with the bail bondsman daily. He had to attend Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous twice a month and he had to meet with a counselor. He also had to give all of his paychecks to her so that she could keep track of his spending, and then he also had to do a drug test once a week. After explaining all of the conditions and Charlie agreeing to them, Catherine asked Charlie if he would take her on a dinner date after she picked him up. He agreed and jokingly asked her if she was going to date rape his drink. She replied, probably, and leave your body chopped up in pieces, to which he laughed and replied, oh my god, I love it. So, the bail bondsman that I just mentioned is a formal federal agent and a private investigator named Tom Watson. He said that he prides himself on being a different type of bail bondsman. He said that he is determined to help others straighten up their act and fly right, but he wasn't going to help just anybody. He wanted to make sure that anybody he was going to help out was going to follow the rules that he laid out and was absolutely dedicated to getting their life back on track. He usually did his digging, which included looking into their social media history and obviously their past criminal history. So when Catherine called him about trying to bail out Charlie, he had his reservations. He actually called Catherine back and said that he doesn't know if it's the best idea for her to bail Charlie out. And he asked her why she so badly wanted to bail somebody out of jail who she barely knew. She explained that he was somebody who needed her help. She said that she wanted to rehab him and get him away from the people that he normally hung out with in Flagstaff because those are the same people that are always getting him into trouble. She said that Charlie was a man who was worth the trouble. She really thought that she could fix him and get him to fly right. She said to Tom, I guess I really do love him. Tom also put forward steps to try to protect Catherine in this agreement. He installed a location tracking program on a cell phone that Charlie was supposed to use once he was bailed out. So by October 6th, 2017, Catherine drove all the way up to Flagstaff and here she bailed Charlie out of jail. After that, Catherine was never seen or heard from ever again. It was by October 8th that Catherine's roommate started to worry about her well-being after noticing that Catherine hadn't been home for two days. So by 4.37 p.m. that day, Catherine was reported missing by her roommate. 
Her roommate told police that the last she heard of Catherine, she was driving up to Flagstaff to post bond for somebody named Charlie. The roommate said that Catherine being gone for several days at a time was extremely out of character for her. She would never leave her dog behind without a plan of who was going to take care of him, and she said that her dog was her entire life, so there's no way that she would just up and leave without taking him with her. Obviously, these details surrounding Catherine's disappearance immediately concerned police. They knew that she probably did not leave on her own accord, so they started searching for her immediately. Police started talking to everybody who knew Catherine, and they found out that Catherine had actually called a friend at 3.30 p.m. on October 6th as she was driving up to Flagstaff. The friend did not answer, but Catherine left her a voicemail, and it was quite disturbing. In the voicemail, Catherine said, quote, I left your number as an emergency contact in case I end up dead in the emergency room. At the time, her tone of voice sounded playful and joking, so it wasn't like she was overtly scared, but clearly there was something in the back of her head telling her that this may not be the best idea. Then, police were quickly able to locate Catherine's white Toyota RAV4 SUV. Her car was actually quite distinctive. It had Green Bay Packers tire covers, plate covers, and stickers. She also had a license plate, which read THXPLP, so thanks pop, which was a tribute to her father. Flagstaff police had actually entered her vehicle information into the National Crime Information Database, and they pretty much immediately got a hit. Turns out, Tucson police and the Arizona Department of Public Safety had consulted the NCIC on October 7th after they received reports of a reckless driver on the freeway. Tucson is about a four and a half hour drive from Williams. This reckless driver ended up being Charlie Malzahn and he was driving Catherine's car. Then at around 1 p.m., he was found at a Tucson mall where he had been using Catherine's credit card to make purchases from Famous Footwear, Dollar General, Sears, and a sunglasses shop. Police found him and his friend at the mall making these various purchases, and at first, when they approached him, Charlie gave them a false name. He said that his name is Cole Nixon. He said that the card belonged to his girlfriend and that she gave him permission to use the card. He said that he was allowed to spend $1,200 on her card. He went on to say that they met online at a website called Cougar Life Only, so he said that this is an older woman that he has been dating. So the cops asked him for her phone number and said, you know, if we call her, is she going to answer? And he said that she should. Of course, when police tried calling her over and over and over again, it was just going straight to voicemail. At first, Charlie said that it's her day off, so she should be answering, but he said maybe she's sleeping in, and otherwise, he doesn't know why she's not answering. Police also kept asking him about his name throughout the entire interaction because they knew that he was lying to them. So, after about 30 minutes, he finally gave them his real name. He said that he didn't initially tell them his real name at first because he didn't think that they were real cops. He just thought that they were mall security. So police said that he was this close to going to jail for giving them a false name, but they ended up letting him go. They confiscated the credit card as well as all of the items that he bought, and they told him that he needs to leave immediately, and he did. Now, it was obvious to police that he had been lying to them. They thought that he probably was stealing off of this woman's card, but to them, that's all it seemed like it was. It seemed like he was just some young kid stealing money from his girlfriend, and that was about the end of it. So they took her card, took the stuff, and told him to leave, and they didn't think it was anything beyond that. They said that they didn't really have a reason to keep him in handcuffs or arrest him at that time, so they said that if he leaves immediately, that he will be let go, and he did, so that was the end of that. By 9.50 p.m. on that same day, on October 7th, university police at Arizona State University in Tempe 
they issued an alert seeking information about a young man who had assaulted a young woman in her dorm room. According to the police report, a student at ASU reported that a man had entered into her dorm room on campus and then physically assaulted her and then left in an unknown direction. Campus police then released a photo that was captured of the man from a surveillance video and they described him as a white male aged early to mid 20s, about six feet tall with a slim build. Then only 10 minutes after the report of the assault, another report came in from another female ASU student. She reported that she was just a block away from campus when she was driving when a man ran up to her car with a crowbar and threatened to whack her if she didn't give over her keys. So obviously she handed over her keys to him and he got away with her vehicle. They did find her vehicle and other stolen items very shortly after that, but the man was gone. Tempe police had actually been in communication with Flagstaff police at the time, so they were pretty confident that their suspect was Charlie Malzahn. I do also want to note that Tempe is about an hour and a half drive from Tucson, so he was driving everywhere. About three hours after this, police spotted Catherine's SUV once again, driving near 59th Avenue and Camelback Road, which is around 20 miles away from ASU. Of course, it was Charlie who was driving. After police started following him in Catherine's SUV, he tried to flee by driving away, but he ended up crashing the car and police were able to catch up with him. Without incident, he was finally arrested and he was taken into custody in the early morning hours of October 8th. However, once he was in police custody, as he was being fingerprinted, he assaulted two officers and he tried to escape. One of the officers ended up with a nine inch gash on the back of his head during this struggle. So it had to have been pretty intense. Once they got control of the situation and they got Charlie calmed down, he was booked in jail on charges of unlawful flight, resisting arrest, attempted escape, and now aggravated assault. Then police took Catherine's SUV into evidence for examination. Obviously, it was damaged. The front end had been dented and the two sides of the back bumper had been broken off. It was also found that Catherine's Green Bay stickers, her tire covers, as well as the license plate cover had all been torn off, but the license plate itself was still on the car. They also found that inside of the SUV, there were several areas of blood spots and smears all over the center console, the interior passenger side door, the sunroof, the visor area, as well as the interior driver door panel. To investigators, it looked like Catherine had been in the driver's seat and wearing her seatbelt when she had been stabbed. It also came out that Charlie had contacted several acquaintances to go down to Tucson with him before leaving Flagstaff, and one person did agree to go with him, and I'm assuming it was the friend that he was caught with at that Tucson mall. However, it came out from several other acquaintances that he had been asking around for drugs, and a gun. The one acquaintance that did go down to Tucson with him came forward to police to tell them that Charlie had a really bad cut on his thumb and it really stood out to him. So obviously all of this is looking really bad for Charlie. It's obvious that he most likely murdered Catherine and then hid her body somewhere. At this point, her body had not been found, so all police could do was continue investigating, keep questioning people, and keep searching for Catherine's body. Now, police went and spoke with Charlie's sister, I presume the same one that we talked about with the carjacking incident, she told police of a darker side that Charlie had to him. She said that ever since Charlie was a little kid, he showed some concerning behaviors. She told investigators that his meth addiction started in his teen years after he was allegedly molested by somebody in the family. She also believed that he likely had paranoid schizophrenia, which he did not want to treat. However, to me, I wonder if it was just paranoia from the drug use since that's something that can happen when you're using meth, but obviously it's not my brother. I can't say for sure. He might have had schizophrenia. It could have been two things that were going on at the same time, so I don't really know, and I guess it's not all that important to this case. Charlie's sister went on to say that he had shown violent tendencies from the age of 13. 
He actually kept a notebook when he was younger where he would write violent stories about slashing victims and mutilating their bodies. Also, when he was younger, he apparently stabbed somebody with a screwdriver. Then his sister said that only five years before Charlie was arrested, he actually attacked a woman with an ax in a Phoenix drug den. And she said that Charlie chopped this woman's arm off. Now, there has been nothing to confirm this. There are no records of this. And his sister says it's because it wasn't reported. Now, I could see that if there was this situation where there's a lot of illegal activity and a lot of drug use that somebody wouldn't want to report this, but I don't know. Chopping someone's whole ass arm off is a pretty big deal. And I don't know if that could have just gone under the radar and unnoticed. I would like to know if there are hospital records showing this or if there's any record of this whatsoever, but that's what his sister said he did, I guess. His sister also said that Charlie has, quote, a lot of freaking issues and he struggled with addiction and mental health his entire life. But she said that she still believes that he's a good person deep, deep down. She said that she had actually met Catherine two days before Charlie was bailed out. Allegedly, Catherine told the sister that Charlie manipulated the shit out of her. But she told the sister that she actually enjoyed Charlie's darker side. The sister went on to say that no one other than Catherine ever really seemed to understand Charlie. She said that nobody really ever loved Charlie and that he was a freaking psychopath. Throughout this, police continued to follow whatever leads they could to find Catherine's body. They canvassed roadsides, they interviewed gas station attendants to see if they had seen anything, and they uncovered any and all surveillance video that they could find. They also reviewed cell phone data, which showed that both Charlie and Catherine's phones had been in Williams about 40 minutes from Flagstaff for about 30 minutes on the day that Catherine had picked him up. Apparently, he wanted to go to Williams to visit his grandmother, his mother, and his ex-girlfriend. So they started to search any remote or wooded areas in or near Williams, and near a remote campsite, they actually found a white t-shirt that looked to have blood on it. Next, as police interviewed more and more people who knew Charlie, they found out more about the witness who had been hanging out with Charlie after he was bailed out. So at 6 a.m. on October 7th, the witness said that Charlie went over to his house in Clifton, Arizona, which is around six hours from Williams and two and a half hours from Tucson. At this time, the witness said, that Charlie was alone and he was driving a white SUV. He said that when he came over, he was asking for weed and meth. He also said that at around the same time, Charlie was singing about catching bodies and was bragging about being on the news. Now, as you can expect, when Charlie was originally arrested, he was not cooperative and he continued to say that he did not know Catherine. However, eventually he did admit that he did know Catherine and that she did bail him out of jail but he said that she had actually left her car in Flagstaff and allowed him to use it whenever he wanted. In the initial hours of Charlie being detained, they did notice that his eyes were very bloodshot and his pupils were very dilated. Charlie was in jail for about four days before he asked to speak with the lead detective on Catherine's case on October 13th. It's thought that his sister had reached out to him and talked to him and that she may have been the one that convinced him to speak with the police. Police. Initially, when he spoke with the lead detective, he was not specific, but he just said that he had information to share. He told the police officer that he first wanted coffee and in and out in order to talk. He started by toying with investigators, first asking them how much media attention his case was going to get, and then he asked them if he was going to get the death penalty. Of course, police continued to ask him about the situation and what happened, and rather than being focused on what he actually did, he was more so focused on the location of Catherine's body. Charlie said, quote, what happened, that's irrelevant. All you want is the body. I'm going to give you the body. What happened will come up in court. She ended up dead. That's all that happened. He continued to say that he will not talk unless he's given in and out and I don't know if they eventually did get him in and out but I feel like they probably did. It was reported that he said, quote, I'm the smartest guy. I just told you to give me in and out burger. I'll tell you where the bitch is that I killed. 
Yeah, I'm a real smart guy. He ended up telling police that her body was located near Mare, near a convenience store that he went to after dumping her body there. He also said that he remembered seeing construction in that same area. He was being very vague about everything, and my assumption is, is that he was being vague so that, you know, he would seem like he was giving information to police so that he would appear cooperative, but still hoping that they wouldn't actually find her body. But police were able to pin down where they believed Catherine to be based on what he said, as well as the time that Catherine picked him up. I believe he was picked up pretty late at around 11 p.m. on the 6th. So he had to have been at that convenience store pretty late at night and police found that the only store open that late in that area was a Circle K. So investigators went to the area and only about an hour and a half after searching, they discovered a heavily decomposing body on Nugget Mine Road only a few miles away from the store off of Route 69 in Mayer. The area had been very flooded due to monsoons that had happened in the weeks prior, and Arizona is a very, very hot climate, so it makes sense why her body would have decomposed that quickly. The body was found to be wearing a turquoise tank top, which matched exactly what Catherine was wearing when she arrived at the jail to pick Charlie up. The body looked to have been dragged there and it looked like someone had just tossed a handful of dirt over the remains. Then using dental records, the body was positively identified as belonging to Catherine Gorosby. After this, her body was sent to the medical examiner for an autopsy. She was found to have 14 stab wounds, scratches and cuts all over her hands and arms, which are thought to be defensive wounds, and she also had multiple broken ribs. This was an absolutely brutal attack. Eventually, Charlie did tell police his version of what happened. He said that he had been awake in jail for two days straight. He said, I had been up for two days. Whatever she was saying, bantering back and forth, for whatever reason, psychologically, I effing snapped. You know what I mean? I don't know what it was. She ended up effing dead. He said that the two of them had been driving towards a campsite, hence the bloody shirt that was found earlier, and they had turned down a forest service road and they drove past an abandoned barn. This is when everything apparently went down. He went on to say that she was actually the one who brought the knife and that when they were in the car, she had threatened to kill him. He had said, quote, yeah, it started in the car, expletive. She was next to me. She said something about cutting out my heart. She pulled out that butcher knife and she was like, all right, it's time to die. And he said it was at that point that he grabbed the knife from her and he said, quote, I just started sticking her. He said that during that, somehow the driver's side door came open and she fell out of the car and onto the ground. So I guess he ran over her with her SUV, which caused all of those broken ribs. After running her over, which I still have no idea why he did that, but either way, after running her over, he put her body into the trunk and drove around her car for about an hour until he ultimately found that site in Mare and he dumped her body. He said that he was a little nervous driving around with her body inside of the car. He went on to say, quote, for whatever reason, psychologically, I effing snapped. You know what I mean? I don't know what it was. Might have been the conversation. I don't know what it was, man, but you know, she ended up effing dead and I got some in and out out of it. After killing her and dumping her body, he went to the Circle K in Mayer. This was only about three hours after he had been released. So he killed her, drove an hour and a half to Mayer, and then dumped her body and then ended up in the Circle K all within three hours. He said that when he went into the Circle K, he was still covered in blood. And the store clerk said, it looks like you had a bad night and he said, you have no idea. Which is just crazy to me that a guy sees another guy just walking casually, covered in blood, and as far as I know, didn't report it. That's kind of crazy. But either way, by 1.04 a.m., he bought himself a pack of cigarettes from the Circle K. After confessing all of this, it seemed like Charlie was more cooperative with investigators 
He thanked investigators for giving him coffee, and then the officer asked him if he could follow up with more questions, and Charlie said, of course. Throughout all of this, police were not able to pinpoint exactly where it was that Catherine was killed. They actually got into contact with researchers at Northern Arizona University to compare samples of soil that were found in Catherine's sock, hoping to trace the microorganisms back to the site where she had been killed. Using this, it seemed like they were able to pin down the area that she was murdered in as being in a wooded Williams area, but I don't think they were able to find exactly where. They also have never been able to find the knife that was used in the attack either. So because of how Charlie had driven literally all across the state of Arizona, in order to charge Charlie in the correct county, they needed to figure out exactly where it was that the murder took place. He also had to face charges in Maricopa County for the assault on the police officer, as well as the two other women at the ASU campus, as well as the carjacking. However, he was ultimately charged with murder in Coconino County, which is where Flagstaff is. I do want to note that with how little time there was and how fast all of this occurred and the fact that literally hours later he was seen by himself and covered in blood, I think that she was murdered in Flagstaff almost immediately after picking him up. Years passed and pretty much nothing more came out about the case until just recently in July of 2022. Charlie had actually taken a plea deal in June of this year so that he wouldn't have to go to trial. He pled guilty to charges of a first degree murder as well as abandonment of a body. The prosecutors decided to drop the charges of capital punishment in exchange for him taking this plea deal, so essentially they took the death penalty off of the table. Because of this, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. After getting this as a sentence, Catherine's family was not happy that he was spared death. At the hearing, Lynette Jackson, who is Catherine's mother, said, quote, life in prison is a gift. What choice did Catherine have? There is no justice for Catherine today. It's mercy we give you. Her father, Ray Grosby, who was actually a soldier and a firefighter, stated, quote, I didn't know it was possible to feel so much pain without being physically injured. People talk of closure. To me, there will never be closure. Only the terrible pain of losing my daughter. Her family also came out to chastise anybody who spoke negatively of Catherine. Of course, as you can expect, there were people who blamed Catherine for her own murder because she got involved with Charlie. Her family came out to say that she's not stupid. She's not an airhead. She is not responsible for her death because she should have known better. She was a strong, intelligent woman who was just trying to help Charlie and she genuinely believed that she could help him. She thought that by taking Charlie under her wing and trying to set him straight, that she was doing the right thing. And I agree. I think that at the end of the day, Catherine met a handsome young man who showed an interest in her. Clearly, she liked the idea of being in a relationship with him, and she probably liked the idea that he was interested in her. But at the same time, she saw herself as somebody who could help him and set him on the right path and show him that he is so much more than he already thinks he is. I think Charlie noticed this right away, that she had this soft side to her, and he took advantage of that. He was telling her that he wanted to do better. He was saying that he loved her. He manipulated her into giving him anything and everything that she had until he took everything away from her, including her life. I think what happened was that he probably was tired. He probably was up for those two days. He probably was on drugs once she picked him up. It's not a secret that people are pretty easily able to get drugs even while they're in jail. So I think it's possible that he was on meth, that he hadn't slept in days, and that he was very paranoid because, again, we know that he has this history of behavior of just randomly becoming paranoid and assuming that other people are out to get him. I think she probably started to remind him of the ground rules and telling him that he better not mess up, that he better not get back into the old activities that he was doing, and I think he took it as a personal attack 
and that's when he snapped. I think Catherine probably did bring the knife with her, either as a dark humor sort of thing, or more likely, in my opinion, to protect herself. We know that she called a friend and was a bit worried. We know that she said it in a more joking way, but I know other people and myself personally who have done it multiple times where they're like, I don't want to seem like I'm overreacting, but deep down I'm a little bit worried, so I'm just going to pass it off as a joke. So knowing that, I do think that she brought the knife for protection. I think maybe it was in her purse and he grabbed it from her. Maybe she told him that she brought a knife once he started flipping out on her saying, you know what, you need to stop. I brought a knife and I will use it if I have to. Or Maybe he started to freak out, so she actually did pull the knife out and actually was about to defend herself and he grabbed it from her before she got the chance. This entire thing could have happened a number of ways and I don't think we truly will ever know exactly what happened. I also think that, you know, anybody who wants to give her crap for going along with his dark humor or saying disturbing things, I do think that her going along with it was just her trying to impress him and get her to like him more. That's all I think it was. I don't think she was ever serious and I don't think she ever thought that he was serious. At the end of the day, this kind-hearted, generous, beautiful woman is gone for absolutely no reason. I relate to her a lot because I also work with young children and you have to have a certain personality and a whole lot of heart to deal with kids all day, every day. Anybody who works with kids will tell you the exact same thing, but clearly she thrived with it. She was clearly so, so dedicated and I feel so, so very bad for all of her students, her friends and her family for what they had to lose. And it was for absolutely no reason. It was actually because she was trying to go out of her way to help somebody and that's what got her killed. And that's why I think this case is just so devastating and so much more painful than a lot of the other cases because she genuinely was trying to do the right thing and it cost her her life. So please, no negative comments about Catherine. The only person responsible for her murder is Charlie and Charlie alone. But either way, that is all I have for today's case and now I want to know your guys' thoughts. Why do you think Charlie killed Catherine? How do you think the entire thing went down? Let's discuss that and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to click the link down below and head to harrys.com slash Rachel Shannon. The first 1,000 people to purchase a starter kit will get a free body wash. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send the suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.